Hey, what's up everybody? How's it going? It's Burke, aka Dan's Great here, and I'm back with another Final Fantasy X boss guide video. Uh, I did one of these for all the storyline bosses, and people in it were asking me to do one for the Monster Arena and the Dark Aeons. Uh, some time has passed since I made that one, and I decided to sit down and spend some time talking to you guys to give you some tips and tricks regarding the Monster Arena and all of the nasty creations within it. So this video is going to be dedicated to that. If you haven't seen uh, the Storyline Bosses one, I would check that out to get a feel for the format and how it's going to work. But the easiest way to navigate this would be to just listen to the intro that I have for you guys that will give you a more general overview. And then have a look at the timestamps for specific bosses that you're interested in. So I'll be sharing with you uh, some information about the bosses, their AI, and sharing with you tips on how to defeat them. The video that I made for the storyline bosses was super long, but I wanted all of the storyline bosses together in one video. But I felt like the entire monster arena in one video would be a bit too much, so I decided to split it up into the area creations, the species creations, and the original creations. So this is part one of three for the monster arena. And before starting off, I want to talk about some more general stuff. Before we get into the specific bosses and their like attributes and that kind of thing, let's talk about when should we be taking on the monster arena bosses this one is totally subjective all i can do here is share my own opinion with you because everyone has their own idea of when they think is the best time but for me and what i did in my commentary walkthrough which worked out pretty nicely for me was to complete the story uh, to capture all of the the monsters i needed to capture to unlock everything in the monster arena and then once i did that to take on as many of the monster arena creations as i could without having to grind or without having to do any stat maxing before I started with that stuff. Everyone is different. Something you might not know is that a lot of these monster arena creations have been defeated with no sphere conditions. So if that's what you're into, you can even mess around with that. But I mean, if you're that hardcore, you probably don't need to watch this video anyway. But just to let you know that it is possible. Final Fantasy X is that kind of game where it gets too easy very quickly. So it can remain challenging, but if you tip it over the edge, then bosses start to become pushovers. So what I wouldn't recommend is to is to max your stats, have 255 everything, and then just go in and blitz everything out. Because, uh, it, like for me, that's not my idea of fun in a video game. I like to be challenged at least a bit. So the way I do it like this, if you complete the story, uh, do all of the monster capturing, and then take on the monster arena, most of it will still be fairly easy, provided that you're well prepared. But there will be some of them that will be super challenging and will probably need you to boost your stats a little bit before you can defeat them. So I think it strikes quite a nice balance between, uh, you know, not killing yourself in terms of difficulty, but not making it a pushover either. So that's when I would get going with the Monster Arena battles. Another reason why it's a good idea to start after doing the monster capturing is because you're going to get lots of nice loot while you're going through Spira capturing all the monsters. You're going to make a fair bit of gill, and with the loot that you get, you're going to be well on your way to making some really good armors. Now, I have a really detailed uh, video about ultimate armors in the Final Fantasy X walkthrough playlist, so there's no point in me discussing uh, which armors are best here. But in simple terms, you're going to be getting 99 Dark Matters for capturing 5 of every fiend in Spira. Now, I would use these 99 Dark Matters on making your first Ribbon Armor, and I would give that to Riku, because she's got the mix ability as well. She's going to be the, the kind of jack of all trades, keeping everyone together, especially at lower levels. I think it's definitely nice to have Riku be the first person that you start setting up this ultimate armor for. In my own walkthrough, having one Ribbon Armor was enough, so I gave one person Ribbon, and the other two had Stoneproof, because to make three Ribbon Armors does take a lot of time, and for the Monster Arena, it's unnecessary. You won't need to get through it. Even the Dark Aeons, you can get by by just having one person with Ribbon and the other two with Stoneproof. So if you use those 99 Dark Matters to make one Ribbon Armor, you're going to make your life a lot easier in the Monster Arena. So that's something I would definitely advise. As for the question of which weapons should I be using, I would recommend the Celestial Weapons. Again, that's what I did in my walkthrough. Uh, if you get the Celestial Weapons for the characters that you want to use in the Monster Arena, that will make your life a lot easier because they can ignore defense. There's only very specific situations in which uh, customized weapons work better than the Celestial Weapons. The Celestial Weapons will be all you need for the Monster Arena, for the Dark Aeons, and for Pennant. So I would definitely advise uh, attempting these battles with your Celestial Weapon. If you have good abilities on them, like Evade Encounter and that kind of thing, it's still going to be okay. You'll still be able to get through, but you're going to make life much, much more difficult for yourself. If you can't break the damage limit, then these bosses are going to take a long time, because even the worst bosses have like 120,000 HP, and that's like really on the low end. They average between like 300 to 500,000 and even higher 
once you start getting into species and original creations. So celestial weapons, I would say, are the way to go. As for other advice I can offer you before heading into the monster arena to try and fight these bosses, I would definitely recommend having attack reels for Waka, that can really help you out when you're in a pinch. Um, I think in my walkthrough Waka has something like 118 strength and he could do around 250,000 damage with attack reels, so I don't need to say any more than that, that makes life a lot easier for you. So attack reels can really help you out if you're struggling. Uh, make sure you have items to mix Hyper Mighty Guard and Trio of Quad 9. So Gambler Spirits, these are the kind of items you'll get for monster capturing anyway, but just make sure that you're able to mix those whenever you need it. Um, having something like Auto Haste is going to be very useful. Once again, uh, the items that you get from monster capturing, you'll be able to make one Auto Haste armor. Again, you can combine that with Riku's Ribbon armor, so you can give her an armor with Ribbon. Auto Haste, Auto Phoenix, and Auto Protect, and that's already going to be her ultimate armor ready. So add in Auto Phoenix into the mix, and you've got yourself a pretty formidable setup. So Auto Phoenix, some form of haste. If you don't have Auto Haste on everyone, it's okay. It'll probably take you a little bit longer, but I mean, you can give, you can use Haste Gur and Haste and that kind of thing, Chocobo Wings, Chocobo Feathers. You can get by without it, but it would be nice to have Auto Haste on everyone if you can. And finally, don't underestimate the value of things like cheer and focus. If you're struggling to survive against certain attacks, using cheer and focus can reduce the damage that you take from physical and magic attacks by up to a third. And by that same token, it will also increase the damage that you do by about a third if you use it five times. So don't be afraid to use cheer and focus if you find that the enemies are overwhelming you. And just as a final, final, final thing, you're going to receive 99 stamina tonics. If you're at the stage where you're, you're at like 3000 HP, 5000 HP, that kind of thing, at the start of every battle you can always toss a stamina tonic, get everyone up to double HP and start to set up your defenses with protect and shell and cheer and all that kind of thing. And that way you'll be able to survive pretty much all of the attacks that the area creations have to offer. Once you start getting to the original creations, they're going to be too powerful, you're going to need much, much higher stats to survive. But for the area creations, with about seven to 8,000 HP, so if you double it from 3,500 and protect, shell, maybe defending sometimes, you can pretty much survive every attack that they can throw at you. So Stamina Tonics will definitely be your friend in the monster arena. So there we go, that's my preliminary advice before we get involved. Let's check out these monster arena creations and see what they're all about. Okay guys, let's get it cracking with Strato Avis, the first boss battle in the Monster Arena for the area creation. So what you're seeing here is mostly going to be footage from my commentary playthrough. So for the playthrough I had my pretty much perfect armors ready, but as I already mentioned if you don't have some of these things it's not essential. If you don't have auto haste on Tidus and Waka it's not going to be the end of the world. Uh, as for stats, these are the stats that I had. This is the stats that I mentioned to you. So I completed the game and I captured 10 of every fiend in Spira and these are the kind of stats that I had at the end of that process. So as you can see, strength is looking pretty good. I added in some strength spheres that I got from things like um, lightning dodging and that kind of thing. So there's maybe three or four, possibly five extra strength spheres that I've put in there over the course of the playthrough. So when you factor all of this in, celestial weapons plus like over 100 strength, you're going to be doing tens of thousands of damage. I mean, Tidus is up to 130 strength and he's doing 67,000. So as you can see, most of the enemies inside the monster arena, especially the early ones, are not going to prove too much of a problem. Because this guy's got 320,000 HP and that's going to deplete very, very quickly under these conditions. Like I said, if you don't have the celestial weapons, even one person with a celestial weapon will make all of the difference here. Uh, if one person can be hitting for like 30, 40,000 damage, you're already going to shorten things by a long way. If you can't and no one can break the damage limit, then you're going to have to spend a little bit more time. You're going to waste more resources and you're going to waste more time, but it's definitely doable. It's not a big deal. You're just going to end up needing more Phoenix Downs, uh, more Remedies, maybe some more Hyper Mighty Guard mixing ingredients. But aside from that, not too much is going to change. So what you just saw there was my uh, regular party defeating them. And now in order to show off some of the moves it can do, you're going to see a maxed out party. So after two regular attacks, it starts charging, and after it's charged, the next move is going to be Pion of the Heavens, which at low levels, and if you're unprepared, if you don't know what this attack can do, it can cause you some serious problems because it will take away 93.75% of your maximum HP. Now what you'll notice there is that it did not take away 93.75%, and that's because it's a physical type attack. So that means that even though it's more kind of gravity based, uh, if you defend and if you have protect, then you can lower the damage done by three quarters. So instead of taking 93%, it's going to take somewhere in the range of like 
23%. So then it becomes much, much more manageable. But if you're not aware of it, if you're not ready, you've, you, you're not defending, you're not protecting, then it can come in and uh, cause you some serious problems. Uh, it inflicts darkness and delay as well. The darkness is infinite percentage. What that basically means is that you're going to need to have a proof armor or ribbon to protect against it. So uh, dark ward is not going to be enough. That's basically what infinite percentage means. So if you can deal with those two attacks, it's not going to be a big problem. Pyen of the Heavens is the only one that can really take out your entire party in one hit. Provided that you don't do anything silly and you make sure you're protected against that, I see no reason why Strato Avis should be able to take you down. So once you've brought it down below 33% HP, it's going to be grounded and it will no longer be able to use Pyen of the Heavens as an attack. One pattern you will find is that monster arena bosses that only have troublesome singular attacks are always going to be overcome by something like Auto Phoenix because unless the battle takes a super long time and you're going to waste more than 99 Phoenix Downs to win, Auto Phoenix is always going to trump whatever singular killing attack uh, any boss is going to have. When you really start having trouble is when the enemy starts to use multiple attacks that can wipe out your entire party or it has a counter attack that can wipe out your entire party. Then we need to do things a bit differently but until then life is going to be a lot easier for you. So that's pretty much all I have to say. It should be a nice easy start for you guys and uh, evading counter also works here as well as an added bonus so I doubt you're going to have any problems with this guy. Next up we have a much more interesting proposition in the shape of Malbro Menace. This guy will always ambush you so you need to have first strike and it will use Putrid Breath which is a nasty attack. Uh, confuse, Poison, Slow, Dark, Silence, all infinite percentage so you need proof or you need ribbon to get rid of it. Uh, it's going to be very nasty much like the great Malbro ambushing you in the, uh, in the Omega Ruins you're going to have problems. That's why I said if you capture all of the fiends first then you're going to be able to get that 99 Dark Matter reward and make your first ribbon armor. So having even one ribbon armor here as you can see from the from the commentary playthrough footage is going to make your life so much easier. You'll need to use a few remedies to get rid of the rest of the state's effects but at least you know that one person is always going to be standing firm. So that's something that's, uh, that's very important I think and will help you a lot against this guy. One thing that you'll notice is that it's very slow, so that's going to work in your favour. Look at this Look at this gauge here, look at the CTB on the right. It's, I mean, these three have auto haste, fair enough, but even if you don't have auto haste, even with mediocre agility, you're going to be so, so much quicker than this guy that it's going to be ridiculous. Now, um, the way Putrid Breath works is that it has a counter. Uh, if you target Malboro Menace, the counter goes up by one. If it reaches seven, it's going to hit you with Putrid Breath. So based on your speed, most of the time, I mean, if you hit it seven times in between turns, then you're only ever going to see Putrid Breath. That's uh, that's important to know. Uh, aside from that, it has a few other attacks. It's got uh, Chow Time, which can be a very annoying attack. If it hits you twice with, uh, with Chow Time, you die the second time because it inflicts you with full break. Um, it's got Gastric Juice Blast, which will hit all characters. It's got a 50% chance of petrification, so you need to have at least Stone Ward to protect against that. But once again, it's a physical type attack, so even though it's got fixed damage of 6,500 to 7,000, if you have Protect and you're defending at the same time, you can drop it down to around 1,500, so it'll make a pretty big difference. So that's also important to know. It does have one final trick up its sleeve, an attack called Mega Gastric Juice. They all sound very similar to each other. But this attack is a special type attack, so you can't reduce it with uh, with Protect or Defend and it will hit for about 6,500, 7,000 damage. So this one is technically evadable. You can evade it when you're at much higher levels and you have Evade Encounter. But at low levels, even Evade Encounter is not going to help you with this one. It's too accurate an attack. So Evade Encounter only kicks in when an attack is evadable. So for that reason, that attack is not going to be one that you can evade. So you do need to, to watch out for it. But it is only a single character. So as I mentioned previously, for single character attacks, you're never going to be in too much trouble, provided that you've got enough Phoenix Downs to take care of business. So that's Malbro Menace. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about. I mean, Malbro Menace is a very complicated enemy, but I'm sure with the notes that I've provided on screen and the stuff that I've talked to you about, you should be able to handle it. So Putrid Breath and making sure that you have Protect or Defend against Gastric Juice Blast, you should be absolutely fine. Okay, so we move from one of the more complicated bosses to one of the simplest. I love Kotos just because of how simple Kotos is. Kotos is just like, I'm going to punch you in the face, and if you try to attack me, I'm going to counter back with a punch to the face. That's pretty much all we need to know. Uh, as you can see, he's only got two attacks. They're both pretty much exactly the same. One's a single-handed punch, 
runs a double-handed punch. They are powerful punches, granted, but even with Auto Phoenix, because they're only killing one character at a time, provided that you can do 440,000 damage before he uses up your 99 Phoenix Downs, you're not going to be in, in any trouble at all. So uh, if you have Protect plus that kind of defense stat, you can just about stay alive with these conditions. But in all honesty, it's probably not even worth using stuff like, I don't know, X Potions or whatever. You're better off just letting people die and just buying more Phoenix Downs as you need it because at this stage of the game, money's not going to be too big a deal for you. So Kotos is going to be nice and easy. Uh, one thing to know when he does have his own normal attack, not the counter attack, he will be hitting the person with the highest strength stat, so you can use that to your advantage uh, if you so wish. So if you want to have a healer that never gets hit, just make sure you don't attack Kotos with that healer, and make sure that healer doesn't have the highest strength stat. So Kotos should be plain sailing for pretty much everyone. Next up is Curl Regina. Now this is, I'm always disappointed by the Curl enemies in this game. I really feel like they just look so cool. I, I always wish that they were more formidable as bosses because if you look at the move set, I mean Thundaga, Drain, Flare, Chaos, which hits them with Confuse, Doom and Curse, all infinite percentage. So you need uh, proof to protect against all of them. And Hyper Blaster, which is uh, one of the very rare attacks in the game that will cause a, a death or an ejection or a petrification shattering uh, regardless of what armor you have equipped. So that's the, the trump card of Curl Regina. But as you can see, every single attack it has is for one character only. So it falls into the same trap as most of the other bosses, in uh, especially at the early part of the monster arena. I mean, when this is the case, you don't even really need to have that great uh, defense against this guy. Look at, look at this here. 3,600 from Drain and my magic defense is in like the 30s or something like that so these guys don't even have shell and they're not taking a huge huge amount of damage flare will kill me but drain won't and thundaga is very easily defended against so unfortunately uh, it's just it's got a lot of good individual tricks but doesn't bring them together as a whole to be able to do it uh, it will get more dangerous as it gets down to, to lower hp um, but all in all unfortunately curl regina is very much a pushover of the singular attacks that it has so there's nothing you can do against hyper blaster you've just got to recover next up is jormungand it has over half a million hp which is pretty solid uh, it's got an attack that has infinite petrification and that's pretty powerful and it has a powerful magic attack that can kill your entire party so finally we're talking about something that's a little more difficult than uh, than some of the stuff that we've come up against so far so let's break it down. Um, it's got a normal physical attack which won't hit you super hard, um, but it can be evaded and countered. That's pretty important. So the fact that you can evade and counter it uh, will make its physical attack fairly obsolete because most of the celestial weapons have evade and counter for the physical hitters. And even if not, most of you guys will have some evade and counter weapons at this stage of the game anyway. Um, as for Cold Stare, it's got a 33% chance of using it. And if it does, unless you have the relevant proof armor or a ribbon, it will petrify you. So it does a fair bit of damage as well. You saw there, 4,700. Unfortunately, it's a special type, so that means that Shell will not reduce the damage that you take from Cold Stare, neither will protect anything like that, defend. None of that stuff is going to work. Um, you need to watch out because if it ends up uh, reducing your HP to zero with Cold Stare, it's going to end up shattering uh, that character and injecting them from the battle. So it's something that you do need to be careful of. So for Cold Stare, I would definitely go for Petrification Protection. That way, at least if it kills you, it's not a big deal. It's not going to inject you from the battle. So uh, Petrification Protection should take priority in this battle. As you saw there, Riku died, but she wasn't injected because she was immune to Petrification. So aside from that, we have Space Time Vorpal. It's a pretty powerful magic attack that it can be reduced by shell, which is very good news. So if you have uh, Lunar Curtains or you can cast Hyper Mighty Guard, that's something I would definitely advise doing. Use those Stamina Tonics to get your HP up. And uh, use shell, use Focus as well. That will also reduce the amount of damage you take from it. What I'm going to show you here is uh, some footage from Garland the Great, who is a Final Fantasy X pro. He, he has some really awesome videos on his channel. You can go check it out. But this is how a pro deals with something like Jormungan. So... Uh, one thing that you'll hopefully be checking out from the notes is that he's vulnerable to all of the breaks, including magic break. So magic break already will reduce his uh, his magic dealing capabilities by 50%. So when you pair that with shell, you're down to 25% already. 
So that will make a huge difference. So if you were taking 12,000 damage before, suddenly it's come all the way down to 3,000. And when that happens, even no Sphirgid Auron can survive Space Time Vorpal, as I'm about to show you here through Garden the Great's excellent video. So I did mention that most of these guys can be taken down even with no Sphirgid conditions. And this is an example of how a pro deals with this kind of shit. So Space Time Vorpal, while dangerous, is definitely not the end of the world. It can be survived, provided that you know a little bit about what you're doing and you pay attention to Jormungan's weaknesses and make preparations beforehand. Alright, time for Cactar King, a very interesting enemy. I really wish Cactar King had more HP, because at 100,000 that puts him inside what I call the Trio Zone, meaning he can be taken out in no three conditions with just a simple attack reels and trio combination. So that already makes this pretty much obsolete if you're really struggling and you have no way out. That's always an easy way to do it. This guy has very high evasion, so when you're at lower levels and your accuracy and luck is not too great, especially luck, you're going to struggle to hit this guy a lot. So one thing that I would recommend is to, is to go for overdrives, even if you don't have trio. Overdrives are a good reliable way to do damage because he's got very high magic defense, so it's probably the best way to go for it because if you're just uh, using normal attacks and your accuracy and luck isn't high enough, you're going to constantly miss and you're going to keep getting hit with that 10,000 needles counter attack. And it's going to kill you constantly because most of us wouldn't be breaking the HP limit at this stage. What you need to watch out for, if it has done nothing twice in a row, then there is a chance, there's a 16.5% chance that it's going to run away. So if you're whittling down its HP and it's done nothing twice, then just unleash all you have in order to be able to defeat it. Otherwise, it's going to run away and that will frustrate you. So aside from that, just hack away at it, use your overdrives, use Riku's powerful items and you should be able to defeat it before it runs away, I hope. Next up is Espada and I put this in the easy category again. He does have auto regen, which is a, a very nifty and interesting ability. Not too many uh, monsters in the monster arena have this ability. Unfortunately, when he's got 280,000 HP, that doesn't amount to a ton of healing per turn. So if you're at very, very low levels and you're doing very, very low damage, then his auto regen will become a factor. But at higher levels, the, the damage that you're doing, as you can see here, even at strength 120, 130 range, is going to be way too much for Espada to be able to heal. So uh, he has a counter attack called Hades Claw. It has a death and poison effect and both are infinite. So you need death proof if you don't want to constantly keep dying to this Hades Claw. But as you'll notice, both of these attacks, Hades Claw and Blade Shower, they are both singular attacks and I don't need to explain what that means. All you need to do is have Auto Phoenix and make sure you're doing enough damage because there's nothing you can do to stop this uh, auto regen from taking effect. If you find that you're really, really struggling to do enough damage to this guy, your best bet is probably to use something like Trio and use Attack Reels because you're going to do 120,000 damage. And if you factor in that Hades Claw is a random attack, so if you get lucky and Waka doesn't get hit by the Hades Claw that he counters with, after you've used two uh, Attack Reels, if you can use something like Entrust to give Waka a second Attack Reels, you've already done most of the damage needed. Throw in like a Blitz Ace or a Slice and Dice and you're already done as well. You can also hit him with all the breaks to reduce the damage that you take from something like Blade Shower and Hades Claw if you have Death Proof as well. So provided that you have the means to do the damage to outdo the auto regen, you should be fine against Espada. Next up we have Abyss Worm, uh, another enemy that should have been a lot more interesting and a lot more difficult than it really ended up being. It's got 480,000 HP which is a pretty healthy sum and it does have some attacks that can cause problems. but uh, one of its main things is that it's very, very slow. It's one of the slowest uh, enemies in the monster arena. Super, super slow, which kind of makes sense given its size. And also it can be put to sleep, which is absolutely ridiculous. So the normal attack pattern that it has is attacking three times. It's an attack that you cannot evade, but it's not very strong. So you shouldn't have too many problems with it. Remember stuff like protect, uh, you can you can defend if you really want. You can use something like Sentinel if, uh, if Auron is around or you've taught someone else that. That's also an option. Uh, after three attacks, it readies the Quake and then it uses Earthquake, which will cause a delay effect. It's a shame. I wish it had a few more status effects to go with it. It only has a delay effect, but because it's so slow, it, it really doesn't make a massive, massive difference here. You've got time to recover from it. So what you're seeing here is my maxed characters fighting it, and you've seen that um, Earthquake does a laughable amount of damage, but 
One of the reasons why I wanted to show you guys the max team as well is just to show you how broken and simple things become once you've maxed. So this is why you shouldn't be maxing your characters here. Uh, I've purposely given Waka and Titus weapons that can't break the damage limit to, to keep things easy, but this would be a way for me to safely show all of the moves without having to, to bother with people dying. And to be honest, on my PS4, I don't have a save in which uh, I have like regular stats. Uh, the save I have that I use in my commentary walkthrough is on my PS3 and I don't have that anymore so I don't I don't think that save exists anymore. Uh, on my PS Vita I've got, I have like a very early on save. Uh, on my PS4 I have I think a max stat save uh, and on the PC, the Steam version, I have no secret saves. So it's weird, I don't have like a, a regular save where characters have like maybe 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 HP. So that's why I'm having to show you guys using this. But what I will say is that Earthquake is a pretty powerful attack. It's got 93 magic and the attack power is 28 for Earthquake. So even if you have Shell, if you have something like 20, 25 magic defense, it's going to be doing around 4,500 damage. So uh, before you get hit with Earthquake, make sure that you have at least about 4,500 to 5,000 HP on all of your characters. And you have Shell, of course. If you don't have Shell, it's going to hit closer to eight or 9,000. So if you have those two things, Earthquake shouldn't be able to kill you. What I'm showing you now is the fight that I had against it in my commentary playthrough and it's so, so slow that it, it got nowhere near being able to use Earthquake because it's going to use three regular attacks, it's going to ready the Quake and then it's going to do Earthquake. So that's five attacks in. And by the time it gets five attacks, you're going to have like 20, 30, 40 chances to attack it. And there's a very good chance you'll be able to take out its HP before it even gets a chance to attack anyway. So this Earthquake only really becomes relevant when you're at low levels and you can't do the damage needed to take it out before seeing that Earthquake for the first time. But like I said, it's so slow, it gives you a lot of time, so you can use, you can use Hyper Mighty Guard if you think um, Earthquake is going to kill you. You can use Auto Life if you have that ability, and you should be fine. I mean, you can use Shell, you can use Focus to bring it down to around the 3,500 damage range, so there's so many options there for you, and it gives you so much time that there's no reason why any regular party that has maybe even two to three thousand HP normally should be dying to Earthquake. So now the sleep mechanics are quite interesting. Uh, up until it uses the first Earthquake, you can't put it to sleep. But after it's used Earthquake for the first time, you can put it back to sleep. So while it's asleep, you can use that time to recover. Uh, you can use magic if you wish. You can use items, although it's probably not very efficient to use items for damage here. But I'm just showing you that it's possible. It won't wake it up. Um, yeah, so while it's asleep, you can just uh, you can just do whatever the hell you like and just prepare for whatever's happening next. So uh, once it's awoken, it will continue doing its thing. If it gets targeted five times, it will use a move called Swallow, which you'll know from the worm in Beacon Uh If you target it twice, it will regurgitate that person, but they will take 10,000 damage, so it will kill anyone who doesn't have break HP limit. But if you notice earlier on in this little video, uh, you saw Titus being regurgitated and only taking 5,000 damage, and that's because he had Protect. So if you look at the notes, it says Regurgitate is a physical attack, which means it can be reduced by Protect. So if your character has Protect while they're being swallowed, they will only take half of the damage, and that will greatly increase their chances of survival. Now, if you don't target it, so this is again another excuse for you to just like, if you need to heal, if you need to put some buffs on, uh, anything you want to do, if you want to put it to sleep, this is the kind of thing that you can do while you're waiting. So provided that you can survive Earthquake, which is a pretty easy attack to survive, you're not going to have any problems and you can always put it to sleep or have it swallow someone and use that time to recover should you need it. So Abyss Worm, pretty easy. Alright, so it's time for Chimera guys, the first monster arena creation that we would all have to face. And I'm pretty sure the first time we all face it because we've only just captured uh, the enemies in the Calm Lands. We're not even beyond the Calm Lands in the story for most of us. And um, Chimera guys will absolutely trash us and we'll think to ourselves, oh my god, if this is like the first thing that we've unlocked then is this powerful, what the hell are we supposed to do here? But before long you realize that it's actually not that difficult. So uh, the main thing here, the key thing here is knowing its attack pattern, much like all the other Chimeras in the game. So it uses Megido Flame, either Thundara or Blizzara, uh, a physical attack and Aqua Breath. So provided you have something like the Victorious for Riku that has elemental protection, uh, all you will need to do is to be able to survive the, uh, the physical attack. So because it's physical, again, that means cheer will work. 
it means that protect will work it means that defend will work it means that sentinel will work so you have a lot of options to bring down that damage to something that will be bearable because you know it's coming you know exactly which move is going to be the attack you can make sure that you're defending and ready for it as you can see here with Riku. So this one is a maxed out Riku, but in a minute I'm going to cut to my actual battle that I had with my lower level characters. Uh, the battle that you're going to see in a minute is actually with characters that were even lower level than the ones that you saw throughout. So you can see they're about half the HP that the others were at, but still it wasn't too big a deal. We managed to take care of things and move on with the Monster Arena. So the only dangerous attack I would say is Aqua Breath because it hits everybody and it has fixed damage. So 3000 to 3500 fixed damage. So that's something you have to watch out for. Uh, if you have some kind of water protection you can make sure that you don't have a situation in which everybody dies. Because that's the only time in which you're going to be at real danger of being defeated by this guy. So 120,000 HP that puts it pretty much within the trio zone. All you need to do is hit it with one regular attack after you've used attack reels. So all in all, Chimera Geist is pretty fun, but should be quite easy. It's a nice one to, to kind of train your skills in because it's the perfect example of where researching and preparation makes the battle so, so, so much easier. Imagine you come in with no elemental protection and you don't know the attack pattern. That's when Chimera Geist gets a better of you. But if you learn this attack pattern, learn to anticipate what attack is coming next and make sure your armors protect against the elements there's no reason why chimera guys should be able to beat you so this one is a pretty fun battle and a good one to really get you started in the monster arena all right time for my main man don tumbury most of you guys who've watched any of my stuff before will know don tumbury well from the don tumbury trick that will help you to level up very very quickly and the reason for that is this karma attack that you just witnessed there. So let's talk about this guy. 480,000 HP, so a pretty high amount, and it has an attack called Karma, which you guys will already know from the Tumbries that you've met throughout the game. This one's Karma is particularly powerful because it will be the number of fiends that you've killed throughout the game multiplied by 100. So the higher level you are, most likely, the higher the amount of karma damage you're going to receive. So at lower levels, you're actually probably going to receive much lower damage. At higher levels, you're going to receive even higher damage. But it's only a single character, so Auto Phoenix or Phoenix Down will take care of karma. Uh, if you don't want to face karma, all you need to do is just wait. Wait for him to come forward four times, because uh, for Don Tumbry's first four attacks, he will not actually attack you at all. He will just keep moving forward and not doing very much at all. Once he's moved forward for the fourth time, then he will start to attack you with his knife. And his attack is pretty powerful, but it can only kill one character at a time, and he will stop counter-attacking during this phase as well. So then he becomes an absolute pushover. So if you don't want to deal with Karma, just let him come forward and just start abusing him and taking down his HP, because he's not going to have enough to use up all of your Phoenix Downs before you kill him with, uh, with your attacks. Time for Katova Plas, one of the harder ones in uh, in the area creations. He's got over 500,000 HP, so he's one of the few that does, along with the Malboro Menace and Vorban. Uh, he's got a fair few moves. He's got both physical attacks and magic at his disposal. Uh, he also has like uh, the armored status, so he's susceptible to all breaks, which is something I would definitely advise. You can use um, Auron's Banishing Blade, or you can use one of Riku's mixes to achieve that. That will lower his strength, that will lower his magic, that will lower his defense as well. And that will really nerf him and make him a lot easier to deal with. So the main thing here uh, is that all of his normal attacks are one character. So even if you can't defend against it, if he's too powerful, if Potfly is a very powerful attack, let's say, I mean, even despite power break and protect and defend and all that stuff, Potfly is still killing you, then you just have to let it go. Don't bother too hard with buffs and just focus your efforts on trying to do the damage needed to kill him because the only time when he can wipe out your entire party is when he dies so much like uh, behemoth king and his really annoying meteor attack this guy will unleash a final ultima when he's going to die so the easiest way to avoid this is to kill him with a counter attack if you can uh, but if your characters are constantly dying then obviously if, you, if they're not strong enough to stand up to him then counter attacking is probably not going to be too much of an option uh, another easy way out is to use Hyper Mighty Guard, so give everyone auto life or at least one person auto life 
and if you can do that then even if he hits you with ultima and kills you you will be able to recover uh, if you feel like you can defend against it it's a magic attack so if it's got magic break uh, if you've got shell if you've used focus maybe you've doubled your hp with stamina tonics there's a pretty good chance you'll be able to survive it as well so here just as a precaution i use hyper mighty guard and I think my magic defense was in the 20s here. So you will see the effects of Ultima and see if I've been able to survive it with these stats. And if I have, then that's a pretty good indicator that you should be able to do it too. If you come into the monster arena at a similar stage. So bear in mind here that um, he doesn't have magic break on him. And I haven't used something like focus either. So I could have really reduced this damage if I wanted to as well. So the damage that you're seeing here, 4,700. Imagine that you had a stamina tonic as well. Uh, most characters, even with three to 4,000 HP, after a stamina tonic should be able to survive this. One of the last ones in the area creations is Abaddon. This is the one with a lot of magic tricks up its sleeve. It's got all four elemental spells, level three. Uh, it's got Flare, it's got Demi, it's got Pharaoh's Curse, which will, which will hit you with Curse, which is infinite percentage, so you need Curse Proof. Even Ribbon won't help against that. Um, you will need it's dark and silence proof as well as poison proof if you want to protect against that stuff. So it's it's pretty nasty but you're not going to see it very often so it's not something that you need to be too scared about. If anything I'd probably not bother protecting, if I have to make a choice I'd prefer to protect against elementals and give myself the best magic defense that I can, the most HP and the most magic defense that I can. So don't bother too much about the state effects of Pharaoh's Curse, you're not going to see it that often and even when you do it's either a remedy or a holy water away from being cured. So it's not the end of the world and it only hits one character. So I wouldn't bother like setting up my armor just specifically for Pharaoh's Curse. I prefer to focus on the other magic attacks and trying to stay alive. Uh, the only attack here which can cause significant problems is uh, Emblem of the Cosmos. It's a magic attack that hits everyone, but there are conditions for it. So. Every time uh, Abaddon uses Pharaoh's Curse, Demi or Flare, it will go up by one. And if you target Abaddon, it will also go up by one. So if the Emblem of the Cosmos counter is above six, it will use Mana Focus and the next turn is going to be Emblem of the Cosmos. So once again, it's giving you a chance to prepare yourself. So this can be with Shell, this can be with Focus, this can be with Auto Life. So that's the three main ways you're going to protect yourself against Emblem of the Cosmos. And if you can survive it without dying, then that's great. But even if you're dying, if you have Hyper Mighty Guard, if you at least have one or two people with auto life, then once again, it's not gonna to be too big a deal. So make sure you've got a little bit of elemental protection here uh, and you've got auto Phoenix and you've got the ability to cast auto life if you're at lower levels. That should be enough to, to deal with things here. What you will notice is that at lower levels you're really going to struggle unless you have the Celestial Weapons because his defense is very high. He has uh, 180 defense, so with regular weapons, unless you get some serious strength, you're really going to struggle to do some damage against it. His magic defense is, uh, is 160, so that's likely going to be even worse, so don't bother with magic either, I would say. So you're about to see, there you go, 5400 damage, so the shell definitely helped there as well. At lower levels, this Emblem of the Cosmos is pretty deadly. So maybe at the start of the battle, give yourself double HP, give yourself Shell, give yourself five times focus and see how you're going. If despite all of that, you're still getting killed constantly, then uh, then you might start to have some trouble. You might need to, to up, up the ante against this guy. Overdrive is probably not going to work too well at lower levels because again, his defense is so high. Uh, in case you didn't know, even if you have Celestial Weapons, the Overdrives do not ignore defense. So. You get the ignore defense capabilities while you're having uh, the regular battle, but if you try to use overdrives with the same weapons, you're going to be doing a lot less damage than you were expecting. So enemies that have very high defense uh, are not very good to use overdrives against. So you're probably going to be better off relying on your regular attacks here more so than, uh, than the other stuff. But again, it's another battle where if you're really, really struggling, again, Trio might be helpful. He's only three or four overdrives away from defeat. So three attack reels and a slice and dice or two attack reels and two slice and dice a couple of blitz aces he's uh, he's never too far away from death that's why i'm saying that 380,000 hp might sound a lot when you're at the start of the game but once you get to these kind of levels and you start using things like trio it becomes a lot more accessible okay so the final customer here is vorban with his 630,000 hp so one of the highest HP monsters in the area creations category. Uh, he is pretty annoying because as you just saw, you cannot armor break him. 
so you're not going to be able to do as much damage as you'd like to be able to do and there is a 50% chance that he will counter you with that really annoying mortar attack. The animation takes a long time, it's magic based and it does a fair bit of damage. So what you need to do is make sure you definitely have shell. Probably you can start the battle with five times shell, five times uh, five times shell, five times focus, five times cheer, have shell, double HP, the full works because he's very slow so he's not going to be able to damage you very quickly. So make sure you're defended very well against uh, his potential attacks and then it's pretty much going to be a case of chipping away at that big 630,000 HP. There's not really too much specific advice I can give you here. So another annoying thing about him is that you cannot evade his regular attacks with evading counter. So even though they look like they're pretty much physical evadable attacks, it just it doesn't work like that. You won't be able to evade it very well. Um, I would say you know the focus of this battle is making sure that you can stay alive. If you can stay alive for, for his regular attack for mortar and for body splash then it's an inevitability that you can win this battle. Where might you start having problems? Uh, if body splash is something you can't defend against and mortar is also too powerful for you then it's, it's going to be very difficult because the mortar counter attack is unpredictable at 50% you don't know when it's going to hit and if it's an attack that's killing you every time then using hyper mighty guard before it is going to be a huge drain on resources and it's not going to be clear if you're going to have the time to really get it done so if uh, if mortar is killing you then you're going to have some serious issues so if that's the case maybe as a last ditch effort you can try to only attack it with something like trio of 999 and attack reels that that'll be like the only time and hopefully you won't see mortar that that many times so that could be an option but even then recharging Riku's overdrive you're not going to have enough overdrives to do it so it's going to get very nasty so I think the first port of call here is to be able to survive mortar if you can do that then the battle will pretty much be yours so even then it will take a long time because you have to watch that animation over and over again and it has a lot of HP and unless you have very high stats you're not going to be able to damage him that much so one final thing that I would say be wary of is the body splash attack does do a lot of damage so uh, you're going to have a lot of time to attack because he's so slow uh, but while you're attacking make sure that you remember to be ready so have everyone defending let's say that you're not strong enough to survive uh, body splash he will kill you unless you're defending make sure you spend your last three attacks defending as you saw there Titus died from that attack even though he had protect and he had a decent amount of HP so that's an important thing to note make sure that you're defending and make sure that your HP is as close to maximum as possible before Vorban gets a chance to use its own attack it'll take a while but if you keep at it you will be able to defeat Vorban and hopefully move on to the species creations which is what will be coming up in the next part of the Final Fantasy X boss guide thank you guys for watching this I hope you enjoyed it I hope it's been helpful uh, as always what I've included here in the notes and what I've said is part of the story uh, if you look into P Birdman's ultimate companion guide it will contain even more detail than what's available in these notes and along with what I've been saying here, feel free to watch stuff like No Sphere Grid, No Summon Monster Arena boss battles. There you get to see some really super cool tactics. And you can always take away some of the stuff that they're doing to use in your own playthrough. So even if your own playthrough is not a No Sphere Grid, you can still watch No Sphere Grid people do it and see the kind of tricks that they're using and apply that to your own playthrough as well. Because even in No Sphere Grid, a lot of it is being able to survive certain attacks or being able to recover from attacks that will wipe out your whole party. And when you're at lower levels, that's pretty much the art of being able to stay alive and to beat difficult bosses. It's being able to increase your defenses to the extent that the boss can't kill you, or even if it can kill you, it's about being able to recover quickly and still being able to do damage while doing it. That's pretty much the, that's pretty much the only way to defeat very, very powerful enemies. So thank you guys for watching. I hope it's been helpful. I'll be back soon with species creations and then we will move on to the original creations which is where the fun really begins and then I'll probably round things off with one final Dark Aeons guide as well. And then that will be the boss guide of Final Fantasy X completed. So see you guys soon. Thanks for watching. Take care.